Hello everyone. Hope you're having a great day today. It's Christmas Eve and hope your plans are all set and you're going to be able to uh, celebrate uh, the Lord's coming, the Lord's being born in the manger of Bethlehem. Uh, don't forget you can find on, on here on Facebook or YouTube our Christmas Eve service that uh, we recorded last night and I think you'll You'll enjoy that, so be sure and check that out. It's uh, it's online right now for you. But I want to keep continuing uh, to to read some Christmas stories. I'm gonna I have another one planned for tomorrow as well. Uh, just so you know, uh, these last couple I've kind of been saving, and they're some of my favorites. Uh, I won't say they're my very favorites because I I just have too many of them that I, I I think that way about. But but anyway, this one's called the town that gave us joy. It's by Marion Jepson Walker, and it's an older story, and uh, from what I understand, again, it's another, another true story. It was Christmas Eve 1927 in the remote, remote prairie town of Hillspring, Alberta, Canada. Mary Thomas Jepson was getting her six small children ready for bed. She thought her heart would break as she watched five of her children dance around the small house, excited to hang their socks for Santa to fill. Her oldest daughter, Ellen, sat subdued and sullen in a corner of the cold two-room house. Ellen's heart was heavy for a 10-year-old, but she uh, understood the reality of what tomorrow would bring. She felt that her mother was cruel to let the children get their hopes up when she knew very well there would be nothing to fill the socks. They would be lucky to have a little mush for breakfast as there was only a small amount of wheat and corn left. The winter had just started and already it was cold and harsh. The milk cow had died the week before from starvation and severe weather conditions. And the last two or three chickens had stopped laying eggs about a month ago. Mary helped each one of the children hang a little darned and mended sock. She tried to persuade Ellen to hang one too, but she just sat there shaking her head and mumbling, Mom, don't do this. Don't pretend. After the socks had been hung, Mary read the Christmas story from the Bible and then recited a few Christmas poems from memory and memories of her own happy childhood living in the United States flooded her mind. She was the next to youngest of a very large and loving family. Her mother and father, although they had been pioneers in a remote area of Idaho, had made life and especially Christmas very exciting and memorable. Before Ellen went to bed, she pleaded again with her mother to tell the children the truth. Mary kissed her daughter and good, her daughter good night and whispered, "I can't, Ellen. Don't ask me why. I just can't tell them." It was almost midnight and the children had been asleep for hours. Mary's husband Leland had gone to bed too, feeling like a broken man, as though he had failed his family completely. Mary sat by the fire, reading the Christmas story from the Bible over and over again. Her mind drifted to her plight here in this. God-forsaken land of ice and snow. It was the beginning of the Depression, and her husband had heard wondrous stories about the unlimited opportunities of homesteading in Canada. After two years of not being able to find work in the United States, and after a flood had destroyed their small home in Willard, Utah, he had decided to move his family to Canada. It seemed, however, that they were five or six years too late to cash in on the rumored possibilities. After several seasons of unusual weather conditions and most of their crops had frozen or failed. In October, Mary had received a letter from her family back in Idaho asking what they, would, what they could do to help and what they could send the family for Christmas. Mary had put off her response. She had too much pride to let them know how destitute her family was. Finally, in November, realizing that things were not going to get any better, she had written. She only mentioned the necessities. She told them how desperately they needed food, especially white wheat, yeast, flour, and cornmeal. She related how long it had been since she had been able to bake a cake or cookies because they had no molasses or honey and, of course, no sugar. It had been a year since they had had any salt to use on their food. She also added that it would be wonderful if they could ship just a little bit of coal because of the cold and because their fuel supply was almost completely de depleted. She continued her letter with a request for some old used quilts. All of hers had worn thin and were full of holes and it was difficult to keep the children warm. 
She mentioned their need for anything to keep them warm, used socks, shoes, or gloves, warm hats, or coats. And at the very end of the letter, she wrote, if you could just find a dress that someone has outgrown that I can make over to fit Ellen, please send that too. Ellen is such a little old lady for such a young girl. She carries the worries of the whole family on her thin shoulders. She has only one dress that she wears all the time and it is patched and faded. She's outgrown it and would like so very much to fix up something that is nicer for her. Starting a week before Christmas, Leland hitched up the horse and sleigh and made the three hour round trip from Hillspring into the town of Cardston every day to check out, check at the train station and post office to see if a, a package had come from Mary's family in Idaho. Every day he received the same disappointing answer. Finally, on Christmas Eve day, he went into Cardston first thing in the morning and eagerly waited for the mail delivery. He left in the early afternoon to get home before dark and he left empty handed. He wept openly as he rode home, knowing he would have to explain to Mary that perhaps the package would arrive the day after Christmas or the next week, but that it had not made it in time for the big day. Mary suddenly awoke from her reminiscent sleep with a chill. The old clock on the wall said it was 3.30 a.m. The fire in the stove was all but out, and she decided to add a little more fuel so that it wouldn't take so long to start in the morning. She looked over at the little limp stop socks still hanging by the fireplace and felt a similar emptiness in her heart. Outside, the wind was blowing at about 70 miles per hour as the snowstorm had intensified. She was about to put out the lantern and go to bed for a few short hours when she heard a quiet knock at the door. Mary opened the door to find a man standing there. In all her life, she had never seen anyone look more like her vision of Santa Claus. He was covered with ice and snow and had a long beard made white from the snow. His hat, gloves, and boots were also white, and for a moment Mary thought she was dreaming. It was the mailman from Cardston who had been known the plight of the Jepson family. He told her that he knew they had been waiting for a package from Idaho, and he knew there would be no Christmas without it. That evening, as he was finishing up a long day of delivering mail, all around town, he had been glad to be going home. His horse was exhausted and frozen as, as that day had been one of the worst blizzards of the year. He was relieved to put his horse in the barn, park his sleigh, and return to the, the warmth of Christmas Eve at home with his family. But just as he was leaving, someone from the train station came running up and told him that 10 large crates had just arrived from the States for the Jepson family. It was only about four in the afternoon, but already it was dark and the storm was getting worse. They both decided there was nothing they could do about delivering the crates that night, but they would be sure the Jepsons received them the day after Christmas. The mailman told Mary that when he went home, he had a disturbing feeling, and after discussing it with his wife, they decided he needed to deliver the crates that night. He would, he would have to find someone who would let him borrow a fresh horse and a sleigh with sharp running blades, and after he finished telling Mary about his decision to come, he brought the crates into the house. She insisted that he thaw out and warm up by the stove while she went out to check on his horse. When she looked at the poor animal with icicles hanging from its nose and mouth, she knew it would never make the, the trip back to Cardston that night and tried to talk the man into staying until morning. He refused the offer, telling her that it had taken him almost eight hours to make the journey to her house in the storm, and if he were to leave now, he would still be able to spend Christmas afternoon with his family. So Mary told him she would harness up their, their own horse, which was in better condition to make the trip back. She got him some dry clothes, fed him that what warm food she, had, she could muster, and he headed off to town. It was almost 5 a.m., and he probably wouldn't get home until around noon. She thanked him the best she could, but for her whole life, she maintained that there would never be sufficient words to express her gratitude. After all, she would say, how do you think a miracle and a Christmas miracle at that? As soon as he left, Mary began to unpack the crates. She had only an hour or so before the children would awaken. At the top of one of the crates, she found a letter from her sisters. As she began to read the incredible account, tears streamed down her face. 
They told her that quilting bees had been held all over the Mallard Valley, and from these six thick, warm, beautiful quilts were included. They told her the many women who had sewn shirts for the boys and dresses for the girls, and of others who had knitted the warm gloves and hats. The donation of socks and shoes had, had come from people from miles around. The local church had held a bazaar to raise the money to buy new coats and scarves for the whole family. All the sisters, nieces, and cousins, aunts, and uncles had gathered to bake the breads and make the candy. There was even a crate half full of beef that had been cured and packed so that it could be shipped along with two or three slabs of bacon and two hams. At the close of the letter, it said, we hope you have a Merry Christmas and thank you so much for making our Christmas the best one we've ever had. When Mary's family awoke that Christmas morning, they awoke to meat sizzling on the stove and the smell of hot cinnamon muffins coming from the little oven. There were bottles of syrup and jars of jam and canned fruit that the younger children had never seen before. Every sock that was hanging was stuffed with homemade taffy, fudge, divinity, and dried fruit of every kind. The children didn't even know the names of some of the cookies and goodies that lay before them. Later, Mary and Leland found tucked in each of the stockings that had been sent for them a few dollars with a note that the money was to be used to buy coal and fuel for the rest of the winter and for oats and wheat to feed the animals. For each boy, there was a bag of marbles and each girl had a little rag doll made just for her. But the most wonderful moment of the whole day was when Ellen awoke the last to get up and walked over to the spot where she had refused to hang her sock the night before. She rubbed her eyes in disbelief as she saw hanging there a beautiful red Christmas dress trimmed with white and green satin ribbons. Ellen turned around, walked back to her bed, and lay down thinking that she was dreaming. After her little sisters pounced on her with laughter and excitement, she came back again to the celebration and joy of the most wonderful Christmas ever. For that morning, along with the aroma of good food, the love of a good family, and a new red dress, a childhood had been given back to a young girl. A childhood of hopes and dreams, of Santa Claus, and of the wonder of Christmas. I'll never forget the retelling of this story by my, by my mother, Mary Thomas Jepson. Although it was always an emotional drain for her to tell, it was an inspiration to all those who were privileged to hear her story every Christmas since that magical day in 1927. <laughs> I love that story. Uh, again, it's, it's just right up there at the top of one of my favorites. I've got, a, like I said, I've got another fun one that I'm going to share with you tomorrow. But uh, uh, to me, that's just a, a wonderful story of Christmas. Uh, you know, the Lord cares about us. He cares everything about us, even about a young girl out in the middle of nowhere in Canada that seems like there's not going to be any Christmas, uh, but the Lord provided. He, he, you know, who knows how long it had been before, weeks before, that the Lord had laid upon the heart of, of that town in Idaho to, to prepare, uh, to, to put together those crates that really saved the lives of that family. It's just a beautiful story, a beautiful Christmas story. Well, I hope you have a blessed Christmas. Uh, let's let's pray together. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your presence with us. You are always with us, no matter what we face, no matter what we're going through, and no matter how difficult this Christmas season may be, you are present. You are there. You're still anxious to, to show your love to us in a, in a personal way. And Lord, you, you did that on that first Christmas as Jesus was born in a manger, born so that he could die for us. Uh, the ultimate gift that we could ever receive was, was in the person of Jesus. And we just praise your name for that. We worship you and uh, we just thank you for, for all that you've done, all that you're doing, all that you're going to do. Lord, we continue uh, to trust in your healing for those with COVID. Uh, Lord, you know uh, each one that's struggling with that. We think especially of Kay right now. We lift her to you and just ask for your special touch on her. Be with Mike and the rest of the family there. and uh, We just, just lift them to you and, and pray that you would be very near. And again, we ask for a miracle in her life that you would just touch her and bring healing to her. Lord, be with all of those that are dealing with, with COVID. Uh, be with those that... Uh, 
uh, are homebound this Christmas season. This is a different year, but Lord, we know you're still good. You're still present. You're still going to help us through it. And Lord, uh, we, we do uh, lift up the doctors and nurses and first responders. Be with them. And Lord, give them a good uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, uh, especially good. May your presence be even more real to them this year. May, may just the, the joy and peace of Christmas come flooding over their lives uh, today and tomorrow, uh, at least for that time, Lord. Give them a special Christmas. May they be with family and, and loved ones and, and uh, just bless them. Thank you, Lord. We thank you that you are the God of miracles and we put our hope and our trust in you and you completely. Thank you again for the gift of Jesus. We give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for watching today. And again, uh, check back tomorrow. Also check out our, uh, our Christmas uh, Eve service. Uh, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.